Hello, my dear students. Um, I welcome you to our first digital lecture in Euromed methodology. Unfortunately, due to the very sad circumstances, I won't be able, as all the other professors, to teach you face to face. Um, I really do regret that, and I hope, inshallah, that soon everything returns to normal and we will meet again work together again. But for now, we have to do it this way, and I'm very positive that we will do a very good job in conveying the message, in understanding the message, and in making you fit for methods in political science and in the Euromed studies. Today, I decided to start with something a little bit more practical with respect to methodology before we go back on the hardcore methodological track. But I would like to introduce to you policy analysis, policy change, the policy cycle, and that is what we are going to do now. Our session today will be dealing with the foundations of policy analysis. I will talk about the idea, about the history, about what policy is in the first place as compared to polity and politics. And from there on, we will then move into the policy cycle and the explanation of why we see what we see, why policymakers do what they do, and how we, from an analytical and methodological point of view, can approach that issue. When we talk about political science, we normally don't uh, differentiate too much, we don't distinguish too much between the various dimensions explicitly. At least not when we talk about uh, politics in day-to-day -day life. We as academics working um, at the university, working also as analysis, analysts in uh, a field beyond uh, the academic world, as you in your jobs, working for ministries, working for organizations, working for the government, and so on and so forth, working for the military. It is really important to understand how particular policies come out, and for that we have to understand what are the subject areas of political science. Politics, so to say, uh, can be divided up into structural, into process, and into content elements. When we look to the structural element, we mean basically the institutional structures characterizing a political system. That can be um, the parliament, for example, that can be the president as an institution, that can be the office of the president, that will be our um, constitution, the laws, the whole legal structure, but also actors such as the armed forces, the police, and so on and so forth. That's all part of the institutional structures that characterize a political or maybe even, if you wanted to put it that way, a socio-political system. Then we have the processes which are taking place, the decisions which are being taken, um, that may be differences also between uh, the parties leading to that and so on and so forth. So now we see we have a particular structure and within that structure, a particular process is taking place. That structure we call polity, while the process itself we call politics. So what then is policy? Policy is the content of the political process, the outcome, so to say, of what politicians do. And it's politicians that act, that's politicians, of course, the legislators that make the law, that makes the law, but the law does not come out of the blue, it doesn't come out of uh, the great emptiness, but it is institutions, actors, individuals who influence the process, who influence the politics in order to get a particular policy outcome. 
So when we talk about policy, we mean the outcomes of the political system, which is built by an interaction of individuals, of uh, institutions and so on, of polity, within the polity, through politics. So that is what we will be looking into now. This slide here now offers you an overview of what I just tried to say. We have dimensions of the political, the three I mentioned, the form, the process and the content. When we look into the form, again the form we call polity, we talk about institutions such as the parliament, the constitution, legal norms and so on, I said it before, and the characteristics lead us to the general order a state has. So we are talking about the organization and the rules of the state. Then when we look to the process of uh, policy making, we talk about the politics. That's the interests we can see, uh, conflicts of interest, of course, uh, a environmental oriented institution might have a little bit different focus points on the interest than an economic uh, oriented organization. We might meet, for example, in the idea of sustainability, sustainable development, uh, creating sustainable economics, sust uh, getting green jobs, but for the time being at the moment, an environmentalist certainly thinks different from a um, banking capitalist. So there we have to deal with uh, conflicts of interest and that is basically what is done in the political process and the politics dimension and that is of course having to do with power, with who has the power, who has more power, who has more influence within the polity, within the political system and so on. And of course consensus is something we try to attain in that process. And then we come to the content. Um, while the form, the polity, gives us the general order of the system, um, through the policy we get the concrete design, the concrete way um, how it is uh, created in detail. So that's basically our um, laws. Um, well, the production, the, the content of the laws, not the law as an institution, not the, what is, is written in the textbook, but the spirit behind it, so to say. Um, and we can see that in the different fields and the concrete fields. When we talk about policy, we talk about energy policy, social policy, foreign security policy, health policy, and so on. So that is tasks, that's aims, um, that is a political agenda being involved there. Uh, policies dealing with the solution of problems, the fulfillment of tasks, um, thinking about value, the value orientation of a society, the target orientation of a society in a particular field, be it energy, be it environment, be it economics, and so on. To break it down to its, its essential Dai in 1992 said it in one sentence, public policy is whatever governments choose to do or not to do. And that is important. Governments choose to do things, they do decisions, but a decision can also be not to act in a particular way to say no. We see that issue, but we do not put it in the political agenda. That is also possible. But for that, to do that decision, the um, issue, first of all, has to become politicized. First, we have a whole number of issues out there, uh, things about which you talk uh, with your friends, with your families, etc., which do not become political or politicized issues. They do not uh, get um, on the political agenda, there are not specific laws created for that, there are not specific decisions created for that and so on. So why is that the place? Why do some um, 
other facts of the case. Why do some um, issues become political issues and others not? That is something we have to become aware of and we have to find ways, methodological ways to deal with that. The next step for this is to do policy analysis. The policy analysis is, as Scharpf once said it, Scharpf is a German political scientist, is the process in which problems in need of a solution are articulated, political aims formulated, alternative approaches developed, and final decisions taken. So that is what it's all about. What I talked about when I mentioned a minute before politicization of issues. Many issues out there in the, in the society and at one stage a political, uh, 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 an issue, a social issue whatsoever, an, an annoying thing in everyday life becomes part of the policy process. For example, very easy example, you go to work every day you drive with your car and every day, more or less at the same place of the road, you hit into a traffic jam and you have to wait. You lose half an hour just waiting at that bottleneck. So you talk to your friends about it. That's not a political issue yet, but it's an issue like in society. And then you decide together, okay, we will inform our mayor, we will inform some in the political context we know to make him aware of the problem. So that's the first step of how something gets onto the political agenda. And maybe other people already told him and he feels a little bit of a political pressure. He sees, oh, there is somebody the people are moved by. Uh, so we have to do it. And he calls for his colleagues in the city government. Um, so then they see, okay, there is a problem that needs a solution. Um, and uh, for that, the political aim is formulated, yes, we have to improve the situation on the street and we have to find ways to get around it. And alternative approaches would be, A, we build a bigger road or we build a, a road with a second level over it, uh, just like on the ring road, we know that. Or another alternative would be, um, yeah, let's uh, prolong the metro. The metro might go now also one, two, three, four stops further, and many people might get attracted to use the metro. Maybe we build a parking spot, a large parking area next to the metro, so people coming from the suburbs, people coming from Sheikh Said or coming from October City uh, can park there and take the subway to downtown, to Zamalek, down to uh, Giza, and so on and so forth. Um, these are discussed different ideas, different people, and finally there is a particular decision taken. That means, of course, that we have to ask ourselves a number of questions in the context of policy analysis. That's the most important questions here. What are policy aims? Why are particular measures taken and not others? As I said, there is a whole alternative of measures and it has reasons why the decision is favored over another one. And that is not necessarily because it's the most rational or the most suitable decision. Many factors play a role there, as you will see. Also, which implications are intended, which are actual, uh, the real implications then, of course, was the policy approach efficient? Was it sensible? Was it just? And so on. So a whole dimension according to which we can um, evaluate, assess the policy outcome, the policy decisions taken. And, of course, with a prospective uh, view, how shall we deal with similar problems in the future? So let us now move from these questions, from the initial idea of what policy means as one of the aspects of the political in the context of polity and politics to the next step, uh, look into uh, 
policy analysis. And for that we will <clears throat> go into the foundations first of all. On this slide you can see the brief overview of what we are going to talk about. The origin and tradition um, of policy analysis. So where is it rooted? Where does it come from? And there we will be looking into two particular traditions on which it built, namely pragmatism and pluralism. From there we will move to uh, a model developed by Mead. It's called the steps of instrumental acting. And that of course will be very important, a very important basis then for what we're going to talk about later, namely our analytical tool, the so-called policy cycle. And uh, after this, I will give you a little bit of an idea of the practical um, application, namely policy analysis as a political instrument based on strict methodology um, and how it developed in the US and in Germany, just to give you an example of how different the paths were um, of this particular approach. The first tradition we can see in the development of policy analysis is pragmatism and in particular the Chicago School of Pragmatism played a very crucial role there. It developed and delivered an important line of thought in the United States of America at least until the 1940s and important names um, in that tradition, important names of that kind of thought were William James Charles Sanders Pierce and John Dewey. Maybe you've already heard of all of them or maybe one of them. Now we don't have the time to go too deeply into their particular ideas, into their life uh, stories and so on. That would be rather a topic to be covered in a political philosophy class and I can just recommend if you're interested in this type of thought of pragmatism, uh, read any of their works. What is important for us is that the ideas of them, of those guys, have been later taken up in the trend and the strain of neo-pragmatism and particularly Hillary and Ruth Anna Putnam and in particular even more Richard Rorty are the persons to be named in that context. Pragmatism itself uh, can be seen as a philosophical movement. Um, it is based on the idea that ideology or proposition is true or maybe regarded as true if it works satisfactorily. So there's a sort of utilitarian component to it. So we say something is working, is working nicely, is working satisfactorily, is producing nice outcomes, so then that is true, it's right, it's good to do it. The meaning of a proposition is to be found in the practical consequences of accepting it. In other words, that means that unpractical ideas, not workable ideas, have to be rejected. We just don't deem them as sensible, as true in the sense of using them. So what does that mean for our analysis and what does it mean for the political context? We can affirm that practical meaning and the implications of that are essential. So the central question that arises is how useful are ideas, how useful are values, how useful are acts, etc. I can even go to the question, is a value such as a human right, is it useful or not? And depending on that, it can be regarded as acceptable or not. So that basically puts many things in question which in a particular societal cultural context are regarded as normal, are regarded as that's how it is. But um, with the question how useful is what we do and for that we have to define the use. What, what do we want to have as a good outcome? 
I know my outcome and then I can see what uh, steps are possible and then I decide what steps are useful to get to that outcome. It also means that there is no separation between the world of ideas and the physical world because the physical world, the reality here, basically gives us the outcome and that determines also which ideas are regarded as useful. In other words, thought, particularly political thought, has to be useful and applicable in the real world. So no just pink thinking of the world and that would be nice if etc. No, if we cannot practice it, if we cannot realize it, it's not useful, don't use it, don't think about it, get away from it. That's a very strict, a very hard cut way of thinking, but that's their approach. On the other hand, it opens up a lot of opportunities still because political order can be designed in any direction, in many ways. The aim should be, and that is something quite important which, ma which makes it less arbitrary by the pragmatists, the improvement of the human condition. So the human condition, the life of people in a society, in a state, uh, on the on the planet on the on the earth shall be improved life of the people should become better again that is a definition of what is good life and across different cultures across across different actor, actors we can find different interpretations of that and that again is also an issue of discussion an issue of finding good common solutions um, but of course the more freedom the have to design a society in a particular way, uh, the more individual and cons collective responsibility is required. So people have to be sensible. Governments have to be sensible. Good decisions have to be found. Okay. The second strain we are talking about as a traditional foundation of policy analysis is pluralism. That has to do with the openness of the first tradition I was talking about. Reality is regarded as a multitude of objects, of attributes and of experiences. Many individuals, many institutions across many different cultural contexts conceptualize reality in different ways. So we see an openness of what we perceive as normal, of what we perceive and also experience as our everyday life in politics, in other realities, in other contexts. Complexity is the starting point, therefore, and the condition for the designability of political order. And in pluralism, the focus is very much on the individual as an important player, an important designer of that reality. A very important, well-known representative of that thought is Harold Lasky, and the first analytical approach to that was provided by George Herbert Mead. George Herbert Mead came up with the idea of instrumental action. He argues that individual action is embedded in and influenced by the social context. So the context plays a very important role in influencing us, what we think, how we do, how we act, uh, etc. It not only influences us in our thought, but also, of course, it uh, might enable us to do things, it might restrict us to do things, just as, uh, for example, the legal situation allows us or not allows us to do. So social context can be political institutions, can be the laws, that can be uh, the job opportunities, many, many things. So we have the context and within that context, sometimes we are more aware of it, sometimes we are less aware of it, we can move, we are restricted in our action or we are enabled to our action. 
In that context, Mead argues that social action, like the interaction between the people, the action an individual uh, pursues, commits, also on the well-being, uh, for the well-being of others, etc., is more advantageous than rationalist, individualist, egoistic action. So when people just think of themselves, uh, forget about the others, don't um, accept the realities of uh, society, then uh, things are suboptimal. That's at least what Mead argues. And um, in that context, he developed five steps of instrumental action of individuals. And these are the five steps of instrumental action of individuals, according to Mead. First one is impulse, meaning the necessity of action is recognized by the system. Uh, as I said, that's the first step from an issue being part of your everyday life, of being part of your discussions and chats with your friends, uh, to the perception by an official authority that can then again uh, develop action. That's basically then the next step, active perception, meaning the development of alternative options of decision and selection of one of these. So that's the um, first real policy process we could see, then manipulation, the first implementation of the selected alternative in the real world context. So when we go back to our example of the traffic jams um, into Cairo City, uh, that would be basically an attempt maybe to uh, put up uh, traffic lights or to send the police to rule the traffic there just to make it more smooth and then see how it goes. And that see how it goes is regarded as the feedback. So the effects are checked with own expectations. We, the expectations, of course, is if we put up a traffic light and send the police to regulate the traffic there, we have less traffic jams. And we will just check it. We will see maybe you don't have to wait 30 minutes, but maybe only 15 minutes anymore. So we can see some improvement. That is what we wanted. Maybe we can see basically nothing uh, is developing. Maybe even we see 40 instead of 30 minutes, and then we have to look for another solution or modify our uh, current solution. And uh, then we come to the final phase, the so-called conclusion, which is the finalization of implementation and the end of the process. Um, maybe we saw that the traffic lights just there didn't really do the effect, but we had to extend the road a little bit, put up some more traffic lights and uh, use police to uh, uh, regulate. And that brought down our uh, traffic jams to a maximum of five minutes. And then we are quite happy. We can finalize it. We leave it like that and look for other problems to be solved. As you can see, um, this type of problem solving is something we as scientists, as political scientists, as economists, whatsoever, can do for society. That is why uh, politics often is hiring political scientists, people from the academic world as advisors. And uh, that is basically also how the whole idea of policy analysis as a policy recommendation, as policy advising uh, has developed. And particularly in the US, with a strong notion of pragmatism, of a strong tradition of the academic world and the political world, the political decision makers interacting, um, we could also see um, a real research program being developed uh, of policy analysis with the clear aim to help political decision makers improve the situation, uh, make their political processes more efficient um, and all of that. Um, so the development of the particular research program I mentioned uh, had three components. It was content oriented, it was problem solution oriented, and 
to a certain degree also normatively oriented because um, when I say we have to look for a particular outcome, we do that uh, with a particular purpose in mind. And of course, we want to improve uh, situations, improve the day-to-day uh, -day lives of the human beings for which politics are responsible. Um, and the normative component is, of course, we have to, uh, somebody has to define what is good, what is the good human life we want to achieve. This process uh, in the US of creating policy analysis as a um, methodologically based, uh, practically oriented science um, was developed particularly then in the years and decades afterwards in the 1970s for example we could see theoretical and conceptual refinements with Thomas Dye uh, who was um, pursuing an extension of Eastern systems model and also Theodore Lowy who came up with the policy arenas model. I just mentioned the systems model uh, brought forward by uh, David Easton and maybe not all of you are um, familiar with this uh, model. Maybe you've heard of it already but forgot a little bit about it. So a just brief repetition of this. Step one of the model is changes in the social or physical environment surrounding a political system produce demands on the one hand and supports on the other for action or the status quo directed as inputs towards the political system through political behavior. These demands and supporting groups then in the next step stimulate competition in a political system, so the exchange of ideas because there are different interests uh, meeting, different ideas meeting, um, and that discussion, uh, that interaction basically leading uh, to decisions or outputs um, that are directed at some aspect of the surrounding social or physical environment. So we have an input from the environment into the decision-making system. In the decision-making system, we have the discussion going on, uh, the decision-making being done, and that decision which is taken has an impact on the environment again and there it causes a reaction and that reaction then can again be taken up by the system as an input and so on. So we have a circle that's basically what the system model wants to tell us. In this circle we have more steps to come, so to say. These were the two first steps of the circle. After a decision, an output is made, for example, in the form of a specific policy, maybe a law regulating energy policy, it interacts, as I said, with the environment. And if it produces change in the environment, uh, there are so-called outcomes and Again, as I just tried to say before in the next step, when a new policy interacts with the environment, outcomes may generate new demands or new supports and groups in support or against the policy or a new policy on some related matter uh, is being developed, is being uh, demanded at least. So that's what we call a feedback, a feedback loop um, from the affected environment into the uh, decision-making system and basically that fifth step, the feedback, uh, leads back to step number one with which we started and this way we create a never-ending cycle. In this little uh, picture you can see basically an overview of the system. You have the outer uh, circle, so to say, uh, that's the environment and the environment um, uh, in the form of demands and supports um, creates inputs to the political system. Within the political system, these inputs are discussed, are weighed, um, 
however, in whichever way that happens, that is not discussed in this model here. It just assumed that somehow it takes place and the author of uh, Eastern is not really interested in that. Um, he just is interested in uh, input, is taken up by the political system and leads to decisions to a particular output. That output then represents a new element of reality in the political environment, in society, and again, uh, leads to new inputs and so on. And here we can see the problem I was just alluding to with the model of Eastern. It is really unclear how exactly these inputs are transformed to outputs within the political system. So the political system is a big black box for us so far and for Eastern. So policy analysis does not look to the output itself, but the motivation leading to it within the political system, which is not um, opened by Eastern, but it is opened by those who pursue uh, political, uh, sorry, policy analysis. So they are interested in why do actors take particular decisions, what influences them, what interactions are taking place there. So in other words, the black box of the political system of the political decision making system is opened by the so called policy cycle model. And as we see, the politi politi policy cycle model is then interacting very much with the basic ideas of Easton's model and uh, is of course uh, uh, methodologically and um, ideationally uh, quite more uh, advanced. One of the central features here is that the model is uh, strictly oriented to the empirical world. Policy analysis developed as an academic discipline that can actively be used to support and advise political processes, political reform processes, for example, um, then um, steps which are necessary to change, uh, to react to challenges generated in the real world. Um, so again, we can see the great pragmatic um, idea behind it, the idea of science, of political science as a service, service industry also provided for uh, the government, political uh, recommendations, political advice, uh, etc. Uh, those interested in policy analysis, which can be offered by us, uh, is, for example, the government. It can be parliaments, that can be groups, special interest groups, and so on. So all actors in the political system are basically uh, interested in the information uh, political science can offer through policy analysis. But of course, while the Americans very much develop these ideas of political science offering services to the government, offering services to actors in the political system, there are other uh, traditions, other scientific traditions, other ideas of what the university should do, etc. So particularly in Germany, uh, political science at first was very skeptical as serving uh, political actors directly. Um, particularly uh, the policy analysis approach was criticized as not being normative enough because policy analysis primarily analyzes what is, but um, it is not apart from the general idea to improve a situation and hopefully improve it uh, in a way that it serves the uh, needs of most people uh, in the best way. It is not telling what should be done from a normative perspective. And we have to be aware that many uh, researchers um, 
particularly in the 1970s and particularly in Germany after the experience of uh, the war and of all cruelties which uh, had been there etc thought that uh, political science has to be a very normative driven science to improve the world and the human lives according to very clear ideas not like uh, policy analysis uh, starting with a very abstract idea to say okay lives have to be improved but the whole system has to be open the it has to be defined and redefined what is the good for many researchers it was a particular social idea which had to be realized by politics so for them uh, they were not normative enough, they also were not critical enough with respect to the role of political power. Um, so they were afraid uh, that political science may become a mere instrument of power politics. And that is of course something um, any scientist has to be aware of. Um, it's good to serve the public, it is good to serve also the government, it's necessary to do so. Um, but of course it should not be a mere instrument, but offer politics new insights, <clears throat> neutral insights, so that uh, political decision makers can best um, decide on the basis of um, our academic and scientifically clearly gained facts. And for that is, of course, again necessary to use the methods we have been talking about so far, we will be talking about after uh, having that little excourse on policy analysis uh, in a very sound and in a very rigorous way. So let us now move to the next step, the theoretical uh, approaches in the context of policy analysis. Taking a large approach, we can see uh, three levels on which approaches can take. We see macro level approaches, meso level approaches, and micro level approaches. For example, the research on state action would be a macro level approach, actor centered institutionalism, a meso level approach, and uh, micro policy analysis, of course, a micro level approach. We will look into more detail now. Starting with the macro level approach, the research on state action, the focus of analysis is fairly wide. So that means the whole system of government of legislation is being um, put as an uh, analytical object, often we take a comparative approach. So as you remember uh, last uh, session, we talked pretty much about uh, how comparative uh, politics works from a methodological point of view. Um, for example, maybe you remember process tracing, which we were talking about and so on. So comparative case studies, that is, um, the method of choice here. Uh, we can find out differences and commonalities of various policies, in particular economic and social policy, for example, uh, which shall be explained by comparing several states or political systems. So when you pursue that, please also refer to the slides um, of the last sessions where we looked very much into the methodology used in comparative uh, case studies. So the reason why I said take a look back onto the slides is that here we can see one of the applications. We have only a few, often just one independent variable. We have various theoretical approaches. Uh, available, each of which prefers a different independent variable. For example, we can see approaches with uh, the variable, major variable socioeconomic setting, or the distribution of power, or differences in political parties, or the design of the political institutions, and so on. And because we um, use quite a large N uh, of data, we most of the time find quantitative approaches.
when we look uh, more to the meso level um, i already mentioned the actor centered institutionalism and the focus of analysis there is limited to a specific part or a specific actor of the political system for example uh, it is uh, f uh, focused on the analysis of a particular ministry for example the ministry of health or the ministry of transportation depending on the issue um, or maybe even just a particular agency of that ministry maybe not even the whole ministry um, the independent variable here is the complex interaction of the relevant state and non-state actors uh, for that we often use network analysis and also game theoretic approaches so again we will use more quantitative oriented models uh, game theoretic models uh, etc so a lot of calculation might be involved yeah, a lot of calculation might be involved as i said uh, that has to do with the fact that game theory is mathematically based it analyzes the decision making behavior of several involved agents and we can see that decisions are based on actual or expected decisions of uh, the other player or of the other players if we have uh, more of them and we have to cope with intervening variables uh, such as structural and institutional factors so again as i mentioned the method is mostly quantitative Finally, finally, we have the micro uh, policy analysis, a micro level approach where the focus of analysis is restricted to a concrete individual, to a concrete uh, decision maker or a small group, for example, of individual agents and uh, specific decision makers. And normally, uh, we use a more qualitative approach there, participant observation or ethnographical policy research. Uh, that is a method we will be looking into more in more detail uh, in one of the next uh, sessions. Uh, but you can still have that or keep that in the back of your mind that in the context of policy analysis, this particular uh, method will become important. now we will um, move further and go closer into uh, the aspects of agents institutions and instruments in this overview you can see how we proceed starting with the agents and then moving to the networks of the various agents and then we turn to the issue of how a policy process is designed and controlled. Yeah, so who can be our different actors, our different agents? Again, here we can see different types, different levels. So for example, we have an individual agent, an individual actor that can be the president of a republic, for example, that can be a particular minister, that can also be a CEO, a chief executive officer of a corporation. So we do not only look into um, the uh, narrow politics, the political institutions, but of course, since we have uh, the society involved and society compri uh, comprising also the economy, um, the corporations, etc., we can have all types of individual actors representing their particular institution, their particular organization. Um, we can have collective actors, for example, a corporation, but uh, we have no amalgamation, for example, um, between those uh, actors, meaning that, for example, uh, we have two, three, four uh, companies, corporations cooperating, acting together, but they do not merge into one coherent actor. They still retain their individuality. They retain their own interests. And in that case, they cooperate because they, their interests overlap to a significant extent. 
in a cooperative that looks a little bit different. Uh, we have a much stronger cohesion, a much stronger combination, maybe even an amalgamation of resources to form a new actor, often even with its own legal personality, like in the example of a business association. So that is acting on behalf of those who founded it, who financed it, who support it, um, but uh, it has its own personality, its own way of acting. The aim in general is to get its own interests into the political process and through the political process to serve on the long run its particular interests best. And that is what all these action, actions, uh, actors or agents want, be they individual or collective or cooperative. Get their interests through, see that laws are made so that their interests are served in the real world. When the actors we were just talking about interact, we can see the emergence of so-called networks. And also these networks have become an intensive area, an intensive object of research. The beginnings of network research date back to the 1950s, 1960s, with uh, David Truman being one of the important representatives. Uh, <clears throat> he identified a large number of relevant agents that participate in complex and often informal ways in the political, uh, sorry, in the policy process. Another finding in this context is that groups that are affected by particular political decisions, the so-called stakeholders, should be contacted before the policy process so that their ideas, their interests get also uh, become part of the policy process. That has the advantage when you think back of the East model um, that when the political system generates an output and affected individuals, affected groups, affected agents are just confronted then with the um, output, they might react in a very fierce and a very negative way to it. And that uh, makes the whole policy process maybe more inefficient in attaining its goals. So it's rather better to um, integrate those groups, at least to a certain degree in the uh, process. Again, we have to look at the context and the environment what opportunities do they have anyway? Because um, a too high degree of involving groups, too many groups maybe, or the case, if it's a case that the um, system opens very many avenues for groups to, to block decisions that can also turn out to be negative in a policy process. And in some of the more industrialized states with a very purist democratic structure, we can see that because of many special laws, um, a process, a policy process like building a new highway, uh, building a new airport, whatsoever, uh, can take 20, 30, 40 years to be realized. And uh, that, of course, is also not the idea of uh, creating a policy outcome. So um, as soon as uh, actors have the potential, have the power, the, the legal power also, the systemic power to obstruct uh, processes, then of course we have to think about maybe changing parts of the political system. So that is a problem, as I say, particularly in the in the Western and in industrial nations, uh, particularly in, in states like uh, Germany, with a very sophisticated um, legal system on the one hand, and rather large power attributed to uh, special interest groups and non-governmental organizations, and so on. Um, that was just a little footnote there. Um, nevertheless. The general rule remains uh, integrate groups affected before the policy process uh, starts. Um, 
and try to include affected special interest groups into the legislation. Um, and the aim, therefore, is, of course, to legitimize, to legitimize uh, the decision, to make it acceptable to those who are um, confronted with uh, the uh, legislation. Um, but, and that is another interesting point, also taking advantage of their special knowledge and know-how, because um, many uh, groups know a lot about the issue. So when you think about health uh, legislation and you want to um, take particular legal action in that, it's very good to have the knowledge and the know-how, the experience of people working in the health system already. Um, when you want to make a law, uh, for example, concerning the uh, uh, coronavirus, it's very good to talk to doctors before who have experience with that. Maybe talk to um, uh, doctors who already uh, were treating virus infectious diseases in other situations, in other countries, and he, they can uh, let the legislators know what they did there, and maybe we find or they find a good practice, and so on. So it has many aspects in communicating with the actors affected. Of course, that might affect the neutrality of a policy outcome to a certain uh, extent, and there you have to just uh, put the things on the balance, put the things on the, and, and weigh them against, against each other and say, okay, do we want the knowledge? Do we want uh, also a certain degree of legitimacy being there? And do we accept that to a certain degree neutrality might be um, affected and uh, the academic rigorosity maybe cannot be attained as if we were just working within uh, our academic institution. But that is part of uh, the political process anyway, and it's part of uh, negotiating interests. In the empirical practice, um, we could find that there is uh, the so-called iron triangle um, and in the context of network building and policy decision making, which means we have the government, we have the bureaucracy, uh, the ministries, etc., the special organizations uh, who are also responsible for the administrative uh, side of the story, and then the special interests involved. And research has shown that there is a strong mutual influence between the actors uh, who act on behalf of these members of the Iron Triangle. On the other hand, what we can see is that there is only a very limited influence by external agents. So those who are not part of that Iron Triangle, who are not involved, who are not taken into the policy process, not invited to participate there, they basically have only a rather little say. Um, the model itself emerged in the context of the United States military industrial policy um, and the talk there was of the so-called American military industrial complex. And from there, the model was extended to include other important actors like science, like the media. Um, and this was then taken up by uh, Sabatier uh, in the so-called advocacy coalition framework and other tool of analysis in uh, the context of policy analysis. So what then is the advocacy coalition framework? Uh, Sabatier and Jenkins Smith developed this approach to describe and explain a complicated policy making environment which contains multiple actors and also several levels of government, which produces decisions despite high levels of uncertainty and ambiguity, because we have to be aware. So just look at the case of the coronavirus a moment. We have a lot of uncertainty there. We do not have the sufficient data, um, which we might have in other cases of uh, years of experience. That is a very new challenge and we have to act. Um, so 
for this many actors are involved. We have the involvement of the government, of the military, of the police forces, of science, of uh, advisors, um, of, of foreign experts maybe, and so on. Um, and uh, that framework also um, uh, it looks into a policy making environment which sometimes can take very long, which can take years to turn decisions into outcomes. So as I told you in Germany, for example, a new highway from the idea to plan it until it's finished, that can take 30, 40 years. So that is really a very long, very complicated a decision-making process, policy-making process um, with changing actors, um, with various new intervening variables coming in, etc. So for this very type of complicated um, decision-making processes to analyze them, to understand them, to also influence them, of course, that is of course what uh, political um, advising uh, personnel always does. Um, the advocacy coalition framework is quite helpful. And of course, also when we look into a policy environment that uh, where we can find processes uh, or the processing of policy in very different ways. So some in, uh, issues involve intensely politicized disputes containing many actors. Others are more technical in nature. They can be normally processed uh, more routinely, largely by specialists in the field and out of the public spotlight. So when there is a policy decision about a particular technical specification of bridge building, for example, that is something the public is not so much interested in because for the normal individual, it's quite uh, different if they use uh, those or those instruments. For them, it's important that the bridge is there so the traffic can smooth uh, go smoothly and safely. If we see um, traffic jams, as I said, or a uh, public threat by the virus or whatever, that is something which is highly, a highly political issue, highly important for each individual. And the ideas then get politicized uh, very easily, which uh, creates different types of policy processes. In uh, the context of policy analysis and advocacy coalition, beliefs uh, do play a very important role. So people engage in politics to translate their particular beliefs into political action, into political outcomes. So we can see, of course, there are different types of beliefs. For example, there are core beliefs. This is very fundamental beliefs. They are very unlikely to change. For example, in uh, Egypt, um, as a very traditional um, society with um, uh, Islam, for example, playing a very big role, also other religions playing a role. So there is a strong belief. And that is something um, you really have into yourself and you make it as a foundation of your whole actions, for example. So a, a very strong uh, belief guiding you through your life, through every step of your life. Um, this might be too broad to, gu to uh, guide detailed policy. Of course, you can say, for example, there are very good Islamic principles um, which should be reflected in society, but of course, just uh, saying um, I take uh, Islamic principles for the creation of, uh, let's say, solar uh, energy policy development, that might just be um, not detailed enough. So we need additional um, beliefs, for example. And these, uh, and these additional uh, beliefs, for example, can be policy core beliefs, though they are more specific. Uh, they uh, think about a proper balance between government and the market. And of course, even there, 
your general ideas which are guiding you, like maybe your religion or the philosophy uh, you think is good, might influence this um, these core beliefs, but still from an analytical standpoint, uh, they go beyond it in a way that they make it much more uh, specific. And that's the, the uh, important thing here. And they are still unlikely to change. Um, and then we have a third set of beliefs, the so-called secondary aspect, secondary aspect beliefs. They relate then to the concrete implementation of a particular policy and they are more likely to change because people learn about the effects of regulations, for example, uh, of regulations versus economic incentives. So there is a try and error thing going on and within the boundaries of the wide beliefs and the core beliefs, there we find variation, there we find change. And this is uh, really uh, important to know about this uh, type of logic. Based on this, we can now go further to our advocacy coalitions. And uh, when we look into what a coalition contains, we can see uh, A, people from a variety of positions that may be elected or agency officials, interest group leaders, researchers, and so on. Um, we think that these people share a particular belief system and these people show a non-trivial degree, so an important, a significant degree of coordinated activity over a time. So that is our definition of what a of what an advocacy coalition is. People on the one hand coming from a different academic or a different professional background, it's not only academics involved, but they have in common the core belief and the general belief um, and they uh, work together over time on particular topics. One thing these advocacy coalitions have in common also is that they learn from policy implementation. So that affects the third type of beliefs. Uh, those uh, ones which are flexible, which are variable within the framework of the um, broader uh, and core beliefs. The learning there takes place through the lens of the deeply held beliefs producing different interpretation of facts and events in different coalitions. So learning based on this is a political process. Coalitions selectively interpret information and use it to exercise power. What we are interested in also from a methodological point of view, the point of view which we will take up again after the um, more fundamental introduction to policy analysis is that there are commonly accepted ways to measure policy performance in some cases at least. In other cases, it is rather a battle of ideas where coalitions exaggerate the influence and maliciousness of opponents. That is also something we can find in political processes. So just look in uh, to the case of the United States where we can see very, very fierce uh, battles. That means technical information is often politicized and a dominant coalition can successfully challenge the data supporting policy change for years. You just have to look into the policies of climate change, of climate protection, of environmental protection, um, where different uh, groups with different power use different data, uh, maybe uh, acting politics or pursuing politics against the maybe even better knowledge of uh, science. In other words, coalitions compete with each other to dominate policy making and that happens particularly in subsystems. Uh, subsystems are issue-specific networks. So we talk about 
one particular policy field, let's say energy policy or health policy, and about one particular issue within one of those specific policy fields. Uh, those subsystems and issue-specific networks are pervasive in government because elected officials devolve policy-making responsibility to bureaucrats who, in turn, consult routinely with participants from their fields, such as interest groups, such as experts, such as other state stakeholders. While the literature on policy communities and monopolies describes the potential for insulated relationships between a small number of actors, the Advocacy Coalition framework identifies the many actors in each coalition. So it's a more comprehensive approach to deal with the complex realities of policy making. Another important concept is the policy broker and sovereign. When we talk about our subsystems, when we look into our subsystems, we can see that they contain actors who mediate between the various coalitions and make authoritative decisions. <clears throat> also, policy, policy makers may be members of coalitions. Policy change over a decade or more um, of course, shows us relationships, um, policies, and change over a full policy cycle. As I said, highway building, which takes 34 to 40 years, uh, sees a lot of change with respect to the relationships, the policies, the networks, uh, the intervening variables in general. And that is taken account, being taken account of within the Advocacy Coalition framework. We also can see that the subsystems contain general routine policy making that leaves step by step to relatively minor policy changes. Coalitions engage in policy learning, adapting the secondary aspects of their beliefs in the light of new information. In most cases, it is the case that learning follows the routine monitoring of implementations. Members consider how policy contributes to positive or negative unintended outcomes and whether their beliefs are challenged or supported by the evidence. This process takes place in a wider system that sets the parameters for action, providing each coalition with different constraints and opportunities. So what does it include? So what does it include? That was my question. And for this, we look at the conditions of the wider system and their implications. On the one hand, we can find factors that are relatively stable, that is, social values, for example, religious values uh, transferred into social values, uh, but also things like the constitutional structure of a state. Constitutions get changed rather rarely, so they provide the fundamental backbone uh, together with the uh, social and socio-religious values, for example, of a society of a state and therefore are a very strong, very important, very stable context uh, for policy uh, making. Then we have long-term coalition opportunity structures, as we call them. They are related to the nature of different political systems. Um, that's basically the structural context. So first we have the social, the, the values context, the socio-religious uh, context, the constitutional context for the general, the big, big, big frame. And then we have the more political specific frame um, that can be, for example, the difference between unitary and federal systems. So like uh, Germany with its uh, several states, the federal level with the federal government, the federal parliament, uh, on the national level, but also on each 
state level, so states are subnational units, a little bit like districts, but not districts in the sense of pure administration of the decisions made at the national level by the state, by the national government, but they have their own little governments. So the states of Germany each has its own government, its own parliament, its own constitutional court. So they are all little states in within the state. And that, of course, is a completely different framework, a different opportunity structure, as we would say, for political decision making. Also, when we look, do we have a rather high concentration of power or do we have a division of powers in a particular political system? Do we have a single party system or a multi-party system? What role, what roles do parties play there? Do we have a coalition government? Do we have a minority government? And so on. So that all influences the respective degree of consensus, of discussion, of negotiation, which is needed for major change. And then, of course, we have to take into consideration external events, events which come from beyond our particular political system. Um, so let us see socioeconomic change, change in government, important decisions in other subsystems that may all influence what is going on in our little subsystem. In rare cases, those external events might prompt subsystem instability and the potential for rapid major policy change even. So that is when we talk about internal or external shocks. That is something we might also see uh, with respect to the impact of Corona, for example, on the global economic system. Already now we see stops in production in major car producers, for example, like Volkswagen, like Mercedes. They just said we cannot produce for two weeks at the moment. We see the aircraft, the airline industry uh, being affected, the tourism industry being affected. So that is something we can really call an external shock uh, to our uh, system. And that, of course, affects policy decision making, as we can see, uh, in a very, uh, in a very intensive way with states closing down the air, air connections, with states closing down uh, schools and so on and so forth. That is something prompt action, quick action initiated by an external shock. When we look a little closer, we can see talking about the internal shock. Uh, which uh, this is relating to the effect of major external change on a coalition's belief system akin to a crisis of co confidence, for example. The event prompts a coalition to revisit its policy core beliefs, e.g. caused by realization by many of its actors that existing policies have failed monumentally, followed by their departure to a different coalition. Uh, so that might uh, change uh, and lead to new uh, corporations between coalitions, for example. And the external shock has the added element of competition also. That means another coalition uses the experience of a major event to enforce its position within the subsystem. So that can be, for example, that um, a sub, the subsystem of security and of security decision making of the security field, etc., now competes with the standard coalition, the standard procedures in the context of health systems or in the context of the educational system. Because for security reasons, the schools have to close at the moment, the universities have to close at the moment to provide security and health and all that to the population. And that is a demonstration that its belief system is best equipped to interpret new information and solve the policy problems. So at the moment, the 
it's not only the politicization but the securitization of a health issue and it shows that a security uh, a security subsystem is currently regarded as the best to solve the problem in cooperation of course with the education system with the uh, health system but driven by the overwhelming need and expertise of the security experts. Of course, we can also see that um, in some cases there might be the exploitation of an external event by a competing coalition which is well led and equipped to learn and adapt. Um, so in many other cases, maybe where there is not so much at stake as in the moment, uh, that can also be done uh, exploiting it on, on purpose, not for the good of the people, but also for egoistic reasons. So that is when we have to be careful. Um, but uh, in a situation like this, it makes certainly sense to have the security um, community have a play a strong role. So let us summarize uh, what we were just talking about for a while. Here we see the Advocacy Coalition Framework Flow Diagram. We have relatively stable parameters. As we can see basic attributes of the problem area and arena, the good, basic distribution of natural resources, fundamental socio-cultural values and social structures, and basic constitutional structures. So that's our value system um, for the society, like religion, like the basic ideas of Islam, the basic ideas of the uh, Egyptian constitution, um, and so on. Then we have, um, we see how that affects the external systems events. So we see change in socioeconomic conditions, changes in public opinion, changes in systematic governing coalition, policy decisions and impact from other subsystems. All that um, are external system events. And we see on the other hand the long-term coalition opportunity structures um, seeing here overlapping societal cleavages, uh, the degree of consensus needed for major policy change, um, and so on. Um, we can see also the um, arrow going not only from the relatively stable parameters, but also from the long-term coalition opportunity structures to uh, the external uh, events, but also to the short-term constraints and resources of subsystem actors, which again are also influenced by the external system events. So you see basically a very uh, close connection between these and both from the uh, values, from the long-term stable parameters and the long-term opportunity structures, we basically can see the influence into the policy subsystem um, and also from the external events and the short-term constraints, we can see an impact on the policy uh, subsystem. Uh, so you can see on the one hand, the factors beyond the policy subsystems play a role in influencing, at least in one direction, each other. So the long-term and the big overwhelming factors influence uh, other uh, subsystems which from, from the perspective of our subsystem are regarded as external system events um, also influencing uh, short-term constraints etc and this basically all impacts our policy subsystem and on the right hand side we can see the logic of coalitions acting within the in our, within our po pre, uh, specific policy subsystem, Coalition A and Coalition B, um, both of them with their policy beliefs, both of them with their individual resources, developing individual strategies, and then they come together, they have to negotiate. Policy brokers are uh, in between them, trying to mediate between them so that uh, 
we basically attain decisions by governmental authorities uh, in the form of institutional rules, resource allocations, appointments of particular persons, uh, etc. And there, uh, then we see the respective policy outcomes with their policy impacts within the subsystem. But uh, the changes within the policy subsystem uh, then again um, have a feedback, have an effect on other policy subsystems, those which we call external, that is the um, arrow in the lower part and the lowest part of this uh, diagram and basically then the whole um, the whole uh, circle starts again. When we take a closer look on the criteria of networks, the nature of networks, we can see on the one hand that durability is one of the criteria which uh, is necessary for to, to describe a network. Uh, durability f is important because it leads to trustworthiness um, within that. So the more the actors within the networks know each other, the more they can develop trust. They know they can rely on each other, that the other actors do not play tricks or lie or whatsoever, but you know, okay, we know each other and that basically helps us to um, be more open in the communication, in the negotiation, and uh, try to work on a good solution. But of course, there is a little bit of a danger of isolation from external agents. It's a very normal social psychological phenomenon when you have a trusted group, when you know each other, and there is the newcomer uh, that is a person or an individual or an actor in more general terms that has not had the chance to uh, become part of that trustworthy relationship. So there is always a suspicion with respect to new actors and that often leads to the um, situation that they are not allowed in at all and one remains in its uh, circle and uh, that of course might lead to distorted perceptions uh, to missed opportunities and so on. A second aspect of coalition of coalitions is the voluntariness. So there must be no official pressure, for example, by the state to coalesce, to form a coalition. Um, that is uh, meant if we see that we basically cannot use the model like this because uh, we or the model attempts, uh, uh, the model uh, assumes that uh, the actors go into coalition because of the joint values, because of the structures, etc., which uh, are there and they get together for pursuing their common interests, etc. So when there is external pressure, that whole idea is um, mutilated and the whole argument basically doesn't work anymore. So we have a condition that the coalitions shall be a voluntary coalition. But of course, there is social pressure inevitable. So for example, in order to get information, you might have to be part of a network. Otherwise, you are left out. And as we said before in, uh, in the other slide, um, when you are, are not part of that coalition, um, you will get no information. There is uh, a strong in-group, out-group uh, phenomenon. And of course, uh, third criteria is the mutuality. So each participant needs to profit from participation in the network. So if you just provide information, if you're just a giver, not a taker, then the whole idea of the coalition basically is worthless to you. Um, but in, uh, as a matter of fact, when we look into the reality of coalitions, we can see that advantages and profits are not necessarily symmetrical. So there are power differences within uh, coalitions that may lead to differences in advantages and profits 
also indifferences maybe to access to information and so on. So um, the mutuality is of course a good ideal and the better uh, it is, the more mutual it really is, the better, but that is not said all the time. We also have criteria to distinguish network types from each other. Um, there are, for example, uh, state networks, there are private networks, there are also, as you know, social networks, not only on the internet, by the way. Uh, that would be a uh, type of distinguish uh, the type of agents, but also with respect to the function of a network. We have different types, for example, special interest group networks, uh, which are there for lobbying particular ideas into the political process, or also uh, political agents, which tr use uh, networks to explain and legitimize political decisions. And also network structures are a, a criterion uh, or offer criteria to differentiate, to distinguish between the networks. So stability, uh, durability, hierarchy, rules and norms, the level of institutionalization, all that can help us to assess, to evaluate what type of uh, network we have. When we take the example of health policy here, we have, for example, the association of doctors. Here we can see a high level of institutionalization of member integration because they have very, very similar uh, interests vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the political system, very different, uh, very, uh, very similar demands vis-a-vis -vis the political system. Uh, they are normally pretty rich, so um, they can uh, support the association of doctors or the doctors can support the association with a lot of money so the association has high level of material resources um, there is a high degree of interaction and involvement in the political decision making process normally because the doctors also have a high reputation within society they are part of uh, clubs where they meet maybe people from politics or other important uh, social actors and so on. Um, when you look at the other side to a self-help group of uh, some patients, they have normally a low level of institutionalization. So by the association of doctors, they might have a nice house in downtown, they have a, a lot of employees, they might have uh, lawyers, they might be able to pay for uh, people to to lobby, etc., to um, have the contacts with uh, politicians and other decision makers. Uh, so that is one thing. Their self-help group normally can do it. Uh, they have, have also a low degree of member integration. Maybe they just meet uh, from time to time in a, in a cafe and discuss their problems. They also normally have a low level of material resources. So uh, it's not like fi uh, 5,000 of doctors who put together their money when you have 20 or 30 patients who got uh, treated in a bad way. Um, normally a low degree of interaction and involvement in the political decision-making process. So um, the structure of a network with respect to stability, durability, uh, and so on and so forth can be very different. And that makes a huge difference in respect or with respect to how they can uh, influence the policy making process. Yeah, another um, aspect which we will look into is the distribution of power within one particular network. This distribution of power within the network is basically what um, I said before. So point three and four are very closely linked to each other, but I think it was important to stress uh, this issue once again. Based on this, we can come to designing and controlling the policy process. Um, and there we can see four elements which are important, the political evaluation and definition of the situation, the definition of the political aims, the evaluation of the possible implications, and the definition of the institutions to execute 
the program. This analysis is done referring to the policy cycle approach. And this policy cycle approach is something we will be doing in our next session. Um, I will give you the next digital lecture on the policy cycle approach and how to apply it. And from there, we will then return to the more detailed um, analysis of the methodology required for that. Uh, thank you for today. I hope you get along with that new type of tailored teaching, of teaching through uh, the online media. And all of us hope and pray that this situation will be over soon and that we can meet again uh, without any problems, without any danger in classrooms and work together. I'm looking forward to that. Let us pray for that and have a good day. Bye-bye.